Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hey, Peter. <laughs> Excited to be here on another episode of Leaders Coaching Leaders. Hey, thanks, Tanya. It's always it's always good to see you. And yeah, I um, I feel very fortunate because I just get to moderate conversations and be a learner. And and we have so many great guests that we're that we're getting to learn from. And today, you know, Steve Constantino talking about family engagement, which is just such an important topic. It's always been important, but it just feels like a hotbed of importance right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm currently. Um, editing a book with Steve, as you might know, and his his work ticks off so many important uh, boxes on the checklist, if you will, in terms of timeliness, like you just mentioned, um, and his 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 care for making sure he's giving leaders on the ground tools that they can use and start to use immediately, not quick fix, but start to use right away to really move the needle with family engagement. Um, you know, no one does it quite as well as him, so. This, I think this session really will give people um, just even a few simple moves that can have dramatic results that are rooted in research. And that, that's, a, that's a win-win all the way around. Yeah, for sure. So let's give, uh, let's give listeners the, the opportunity to learn from Steve Constantino. Let's get to it. So Steve Constantino, welcome to the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. We've known each other for a long time. You actually grew up not too far away from where I grew up too, exactly from in, right. in New York State. I don't know if people always know that because they they think of you as a you know, superintendent in Virginia and everything else. But uh, right, yeah, I the New York roots are are always there. It's been a long time since I've been there, but yep, the Capital District is something I know very well. <laughs> That's right. So. You know, you are the, uh, there are a few things that I love about your work. Number one is that you call it family engagement. And mm -hmm. you've always been very specific about using the words family engagement. Is there, is there really a, a, a main reason why? There actually is. Um, several years ago, and I don't, I can't exactly pinpoint when, but there began a transition in research. You know, for many years, we referred to the term as parent involvement. Mm -hmm. And researchers, began as, as research flows, and it's been flowing for years and years, a couple of discoveries were made. One was that use of the word parent can be extremely limiting when we're dealing with adult caregivers of children, because there's a significant percentage of adults caring for children who are not their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, I, I think that this work didn't want to pigeonhole or narrow or at or worse, alienate someone, you know, calling them something that they may not be. So research kind of morphed to the word family because it, for lack of a better term, covers everybody, um, you know, and even st students who might be in temporary family situations. At that moment in their life, it's still their family. I think the other word was replaced or is being replaced or interchanged because there have been a lot of discoveries about involvement, and one of them is one can be involved, but not engaged. Mm -hmm. And I really think that many times that's the root of some of the challenges that we have with uh, family engagement, because uh, uh, you know, someone can come to an event because they feel obligated to support their child, uh, but they may not be engaged with it. So uh, in the word engagement kind of hopefully took it to a higher level. So well, that's, where, that's where it came from. No, and I, I want to be able to go back to that a little bit because I've had some recent um, experiences where with family engagement, we know that we live in this, you know, polarizing political world too. But one of the things that you've recently done, so your, your, your book on family engagement that came out a few years ago that I was honored to actually write the forward for, yep. huge seller. And then you, you ended up doing a second edition, which is selling extremely well again. Yeah. Uh, why did you do the, why the second um, second edition? Well, when we work with schools and districts, I like to try to, when possible, implement small action research studies. I like to know 
what's working, what's not working, what are schools, what's resonating with schools, what are schools having difficulty with? You know, if if I write something or I, I try to share a concept and it makes perfect sense to me, but makes no sense to anybody else, <laughs> um, then we need to make some changes. So I've started soliciting feedback from tons of people about the first edition and got some really good feedback about things that were missing. Uh, and I can talk specifically about two of those things as examples. And then also things that just didn't seem to be resonating. You know, it just people were like, yeah, you know, this doesn't really, this doesn't help me. Uh, and so when the opportunity for the second edition came along, it gave me an opportunity for lack of a better term to, to fix some of the things that I thought needed to be fixed, but also to make some additions. And I'm really happy with the additions we made. One, as a result of the work in the field, we modified the logic model a bit. Uh, to, it's a subtle change in words, but I think it's an important change in words. Uh, for example, principle three used to be empowering families. Mm -hmm. Well, that that word was often misconstrued. Um, you know, and empowering meaning you know, giving them a torch to light and storm the Bastille. That wasn't the kind of empowering we were talking about. So, I went back to the word efficacy um, and looked at family efficacy. So it changed a little bit there. And then some subtle changes in some other areas about developing relationships uh, as opposed to uh, words that we previously used. So we had a chance to update the research and update the practice and make it more relevant. I think the second thing, major thing, and there's lots of little changes and lots of things that it's not important to go into now, but two of the big changes were two things that I had heard in my travels. One was, how does this relate to equity? Mm -hmm. is, is family engagement have a role in equity? And of course, I believe it does very much. So we, there was a chapter on disengaged families and that ch chapter got significantly expanded uh, to include equity and issues of implicit bias, which also are challenges when we work with families uh, around the country. And I think the second major addition was the, was the addition of a chapter on family engagement at the middle and high school level. I um, I often joke and say, if I had a dollar every time somebody said, so how do you engage families at the middle and high school? I'd probably be sailing around the world on my yacht right now, but uh, it seemed needed. Uh, so I was very happy that I had a chance now to add that chapter as well and some other subtle changes, but uh, I was pretty pleased with with the second attempt. No, I think it's I think it's great. And I also think it's an important thing that people who may not write books don't always understand is that when you write a book and you put it out there and you have this, you know what you mean when you're writing it, right? And you do all the things you can to take away the assumptions. Sometimes people will just look at the words and run away with it with a very different meaning, despite um, what you've tried to do to, to clarify that. So yeah, and, and that word empower was, was in places problematic. Um, and I found myself a lot of times explaining empowerment, and I think I explained it enough to say if I ever get a chance to change it, I think we, I think we need to, what we were really talking about was how do you promote the efficacy of families? How do you empower them to help their own children? Um, I think the subtle word change has made a big difference already, so people what get it quicker. What lessons have you learned over the past couple of years with the pandemic? I know you've always, you know, had your thumb on the pulse of what's going on. Um, what what sort of things have you learned about family engagement over the past couple of years during the pandemic? Like, were there any surprises um, of issues that were coming up or, or anything like that? Well, there were a couple of things that one could probably expect, I think, and then maybe a surprise or two. I think um, at the beginning of the pandemic and throughout the first perhaps six to eight months of the pandemic, when things were locked down and schools were scrambling and families were scrambling. Um, I think it ripped the lid off of the fact that we may not have engaged as many families as we thought we were. Um, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of, and, well, I'm not telling you anything you haven't read and seen and heard. Um, so that probably was to be expected. I think um, <clears throat> there was a study done by Learning Her Heroes and there were a couple of um, there were a couple of statistics out of that study that kind of surprised me, um, although they shouldn't, but they did. 
one of them was that about, I don't remember, I think it was hovering around 70% of the families that participated in this study had indicated that they had a newfound appreciation for what teachers did in their classrooms, which I think is extremely positive. Mm-hmm. Um, but along with that came about the same percentage of families who said, we're getting this higher level of engagement now. You know, if parents are kind of leaning over the Zoom screens and watching school. Parents are now saying, well, in a post-pandemic society, we want the same level of engagement now that we've we've kind of wet our appetite to knowing what's going on in school today, as opposed to never knowing what's going on. Um, and and I think I think the third thing uh, that the the third set of data that wasn't a surprise was just that there's always been a correlation between disengagement and and socioeconomic status, for example. And when we saw the 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 more significant learning loss in socioeconomically disadvantaged students, we can correlate that directly to either little or no engagement of their families prior to or within uh, within COVID. So I think there's some good news and some challenges that have come out of it. Yeah, one of the, lately, um, you know, with, the political polarization and, you know, a friend of mine posted on Facebook yesterday, uh, an, it was an announcement from a person who's running for school board pretty close to where I am in upstate New York. And one of the things that they wrote is the bullet points for why they need to be on the board is to give parents a voice in education. Parents <clears throat> finally need to have a voice in education. It's actually something that I've heard politicians say, um, we're dealing with, you know, New York State, uh, uh, some people running for governor, and they're, that's the rally cry to giving parents a voice in education. How do you, how do you help schools kind of deal with this issue? Because in some ways, I look at it and say, well, there is a, a voice of families within schools because parents want certain things. But it seems to be like there's just this um, lightning rod where it comes to families having a voice in education. How do you help superintendents and school building leaders and teachers deal with that kind of political issue? Uh, That's a great question. And it's kind of a multifaceted question. I think I always start with what do you mean by voice? Uh, Because when I talk about family engagement and voice, I mean a voice in the educational lives of their children, an ongoing, an ongoing role in the educational lives of their children. I don't mean, uh, you know, um, choosing my words carefully here, but <laughs> some people look at this like, you know, giving, giving power or, you know, you have power over curriculum and you have power over this, you have power over that. That's where this whole political thing has gotten a little bit dicey, I think. Um, I do believe, however, and, and this may be <laughs> this may be naive, but I do believe that if we could do a better job of engaging the disengaged, you know, I often say we're very good at engaging the already engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, if we could do a better job with the disengaged, because a lot of the a lot of the turmoil that we're seeing seems to be coming from portions of communities where families just feel in the dark. They don't feel it. And they see something on the news and that that escalates as like a match to a gasoline filled rag. And all of a sudden now we're arguing about a book or we're arguing about something, who, this or that or the other thing. Whereas I think if we could have done a better job of including families in the process of teaching and learning all along, we may have been able to avoid some of this. Now that's, again, I qualify that by saying that can be extremely Pollyannish and extremely naive, but it makes sense. It seems to make sense, logical sense to me. Um, I go back to uh, uh, 1970s, you know, when there was racial integration issues. And there was a actually a movie made about this particular issue where a community came together in a charrette. You know, here you had a, a white population and a black population there was no middle, (laughs) you know, and they came together uh, over a series of months to come to commonalities, to talk about commonalities. 
And that that conversation and the relationships that were built between people who didn't have relationships before, who thought they knew something or had assumed something, started to move that school district toward its final vote of 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 uh, resegregate, you know, re uh, dis disaggregate. <laughs> I can't think of you know the word I'm trying to use. Yeah. Desegregating. Thank you. I'm losing command of the English language while I speak. Um, and so I thought that was a very healthy model that that we could use. You know, we see a lot of things on television now where families are storming board meetings and uh, they're, you know, kind of banging their fists and we're, it's, it's masks or vaccines or curriculum or this or that or the other thing. And I've had so many school boards call me to say, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And 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 I say, well, you know, what's, what's happening in many districts, for example, is that they're limiting public comment or they're eliminating public comment or they're, you can only call in or you can only write in. And I think that's exactly the opposite that we should do. I think what we should do is come together as a community and talk about, talk reasonably, set parameters and talk reasonably about our differences, educate one another about things we might not know and then come to some kind of consensus on what direction we're going to move forward. If we can, if we can desegregate school systems using that process, it seems to me then we could take that very same philosophy and apply it to some of the things that seem to be rather divisive at the moment. No, I like I like that. It reminds me a couple of years ago, um, like superintendents were starting to do town halls to help community members understand, you know. To, virtual town halls through Facebook or whatever right. to help families understand the pandemic and masks and you know virtual learning all of that kind of stuff so it sounds like continuing that process of, of a town hall um, well yeah I, I think you know take it out of family engagement put it into leadership theory and organizational theory and you know can you name an organization that has ever thrived without strong relationships I right. can't think of one um, and I think the same thing applies applies here. Uh, we, we are a relational business. That's, it's what we do. And there are difficulties, there are challenges. I'm not trying to suggest that it's easy, uh, but it can be done. And it has been done successfully in a lot of different places. Um, so, you know, having, having opportunities for, to engage. And, you know, I was talking to one of our client school districts uh, who wanted to do something. And I and, and what I said to them was, I think the town hall philosophy is a great idea, but put some structure to it. Uh, don't, because if you don't, you're just going to have a bunch of people yelling at you from the oh, audience. Yeah. And it's not going to be a whole sure. lot better than it was in the board meeting. So tell people, this is what we, you know, here's five questions we want to answer tonight, or here's three issues that we have. And we would, we're going to break into groups and talk about, well, what do we think about the do some kind of a structure so that something productive can come out of it outside of, you know, just disagreeing and letting the emotions take over. Yeah, no, I like that. I think that's great. So I know that um, with your family engagement work, you've been looking at, you know, case study approach. I know you've been looking at those kind of things because of all the great work that's going on all over the place. So ending on the positive, what are things that you're seeing that schools are doing some doing really well? Like when you're when you're doing your work, and you're going to work with these schools, and you're just thinking, "Wow, this is, you know, this this is what I wish every school was doing." What are some examples of that? You know, there there are several examples out there, and I think uh, as I have written and been consistent uh, in my my thinking, is that it really does start with leadership. It starts with somebody who says, we're going this way, uh, and, and this is why. And so in those, in those areas where we have seen strong superintendent support, district organization, understanding that this is not a quick fix strategy, but a long-term commitment to a culture change, um, those are the schools and the districts that see, start to see success. They start to see differences. They're taking it slowly. The pandemic has, of course, wreaked havoc <laughs> uh, with everything. And so <clears throat> I'm thinking of one uh, fairly large school district that we work with that <clears throat> could have just thrown their hands up with the pandemic and said, forget this. You know, we'll get to it when the pandemic is over. 
Well, they doubled down and said, we want to remodel the whole thing so that we can continue this work because they got the idea that maybe now more than ever, this might be important. And so leadership, culture change, um, and a willingness, I, I, I really think a willingness to step out of traditional thinking and to examine our own practices. You know, I often talk about, <clears throat> I'll give an example in a workshop of um, a pretty typical line in a teacher handbook that says, uh, if a child is gonna receive a D or an F, you must call the parent first. And that's a pretty common, you know, it's a pretty common thought process. Most schools do that. And, but I offer, I said, you know, there's nothing in the handbook that says if a child raises their grade by a letter grade, we must call a parent. Mm -hmm. So I think if we begin to, the schools that are examining their own procedures, they're looking through a different lens, they're stepping out of their comfort zone, which isn't easy, I admit, and I applaud them for it. They start to see things differently. They start to understand home visits, the schools that embrace home visits, for example, quickest way to dispel uh, assumptions on both sides, assumptions that we carry as educators that families may carry at us. A 20 minute conversation in someone's living room can literally change the course <clears throat> of a relationship. And almost 100%, this is research that comes out of the parent teacher home visit project, uh, almost 100% of the teachers who were apprehensive about their first home visit at the end of the first home visit wondered why they hadn't been doing this the entire time. Mm -hmm. that, that the experience they had was nothing like that they had imagined it would be. Um, and so the, the schools that are doing those things are, are seeing progress, they're moving forward, they're, they're seeing successes. Uh, their events that they're hosting for families, they, you know, we talk about remodeling them a little bit so that they're more inclusive. Um, schools that are making things available in live streaming and online and ways in which families can connect. I think those are the areas where we're seeing some really, really great successes uh, in, in engaging families that have traditionally been disenfranchised. I think what I, re what I appreciate about your work and what I respect about your work is you are giving families voices, uh, I mean, for sure. And you're, you're giving very practical ways in, it, in order to do that. But I also think what you're doing is asking schools to not make the assumption that they always know what families need and to go in as a learner too, to say, what can you learn during this process? And you give them, you give them a pathway to be able to do yeah. that. Too. And I think that can be really powerful. There's a quick example of that, if I may. I know we're running yeah. out of time, but we talk about conferences. I hear that's another thing I hear everywhere I go. Can't get parents to come to conferences. You know that. Uh, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, you know, why don't you try this? I said, why don't you call the parents and families up prior to the conference, tell them that you're excited about the opportunity to meet with them, and ask them what they'd like to know. Mm -hmm. uh, because we know that engagement research, you know, we have to make things meaningful and relevant to people. And when a parent says to you, well, you know, I, I, I don't know that my son is reading well enough. Is he reading well enough? Well, we're going to have that answer for you when you come to the conference. <clears throat> it doesn't preclude us from sharing with families things that we know we should share, but it gets there. It gets it immediately makes it relevant to them and their child. And in districts that have applied this simple principle of just kind of that pre-call invitation questioning, have seen anywhere from 15 to 40% increases immediately in the numbers of families attending conferences. So yeah, I think that if we can take, a, and you know, sometimes I, I've been called all kinds of things, you know, the velvet hammer, or I'm not sure all, all of these names that people have gotten for me. And I certainly don't try to go into a room to alienate educators, but I make it very clear from the beginning that I am here to push you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> And I am here to have you look at something perhaps differently than you've ever looked at it before. And I think that's that's important. I, you know, as a, you remind me when I was a school principal, I used to flip communication with parents because I, I felt like I wanted them to know, you know, what are we going to be able to talk about? What what will parent the parent teacher conference? You know, <clears throat> yes, we're going to talk about your report card, but you know, here are some questions you could ask, but please feel free to bring your questions and give families time to actually speak instead of being on the receiving end of one-sided dialogue. And yeah. 
you know, you do that very well within your work. And I think it's important. So. Right. And, and a lot of the things, you know, the, the experiences that I had in trying to do this myself, uh, uh, I can remember the parent coming in, uh, the parent was uh, from another country uh, and they were in school one morning and <clears throat> said hello to me, very happy, very smiley. And oh, they loved everything. Their son was doing great. And in the back of my mind, I thought, gee, I thought I had heard that this young man was not doing all that well. And so I kind of quizzed the parent and I said, well, how are things going? Blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, we saw his report card and he, uh, uh, he came home with all Fs and we, we understand that that is the best. And I had to sit him down and explain to him. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that an awkward that conversation. wasn't really the best. Yeah. But that, that one example, that one experience I had has stuck with me for years and years and years about making assumptions or just putting information out um, and hoping, you know, communication, you have to have evidence that a message was received, but you also need evidence that a message is understood. And I think the more we can get to that point um, so that we are not just making an assumption that everybody knows what we're talking about, and that we look at language, we look at communication protocols, there's all kinds of things we can talk about. But those, those little things add up quickly yeah. and make people feel much more comfortable in building a relationship uh, with their child's teacher or with their child's school. I think that is a perfect ending for the conversation. So Steve Constantino, thank you so much with all of your work that you've been doing in family engagement and in general, but thanks for being on the Leaders Coach and Leaders Podcast. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, what did you think of the conversation? It was, good to, it was good to talk to Steve because I've known Steve for a long time. He's actually, uh, you know, we had something in common. He reached out to me a long time ago when I was writing the Finding Common Ground blog for Education Week because he was going to write it. He was one of the first people to write a guest blog for me. And he told me that he was from, he grew up probably 20 minutes away from where I grew up. Yeah, it's a small world that six degrees or seven degrees of separation <laughs> sometimes gets really small. Yeah, Steve is so great to listen to. And there's so many things that I feel like I, I could end on or, or, or just bring to light as we close on this. But one that really stood out for me is him saying that, you know, schools are such a hotbed of so much controversy right now. And that there can be a temptation to close down and silence voices because it, 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 can, it can be frankly quite scary to try to manage uh, people who have such strong, strongly different views, but that we should actually be doing the exact opposite and leaning into discourse. Um, that this is the exact time that structured, well-facilitated dialogue is called for. Um, and I think, you know, again, people who get into his work could really begin to find the tools to do that. Um, and so I thought that that was really profound to to tell people that it's it's actually more talk that we need with each other, but it just has to be talk that, you know, is conducive for growth. Yeah, I, I, I certainly appreciate that because he's absolutely right. I think these are conversations we need to be able to talk about. Um, the other thing that I really enjoy about the maybe the perspective that he has is it's about schools going into the relationship building with families, but they do it from a learner's perspective. And I'm always going to be a big fan of going in as a learner. Um, you know, I don't want it to be about power and who has more control. And I want to know, I want to, you know, my best moments with, with families when I was a teacher and a school principal was when I went in as a learner and I, I never have regretted that because it has developed relationships that I still have to this day, years and years later. So I always appreciate the fact that he, he does that. He talks about how schools can go and, and, you know, in the example that he gave when he was talking about home visits, um, you know, so many times home visits were almost about scaring families. Mm -hmm. And when he talks about home visits, it's about learning about the families and building a relationship. So yeah, he just, he has a lot of really great practical information. He has the credibility to do it because he's been in so many different roles um, in, in, his, in his life. So really enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, that was a great one. Well, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to learning with you again on our next podcast. So 
For sure, yes. Until, until we meet again. All right, thank you. Thanks, Peter.